I trained people to TIG weld for nearly two decades. When I would start training people, they would be able to do stuff like this pretty well. Running passes on flat plate, joining plates together, welding along a joint. And there was one trick that I would ask people to show me. And even people with a good amount of experience TIG welding could not do this trick. So I'm challenging you here today. If I asked you to do this trick, could you do it? Are you ready for this? Let's say this is your welding piece that you have just finished for me here. Oh wow, this looks great, right on. Now watch this. Make this hole go away and don't let me see any evidence it was ever there. You would not believe how many people were not able to do this for me. It seems simple, some people could fill it and take care of the problem, and some people would have enough skill to kind of make it disappear, and yes, I mean disappear. But I would honestly say about 99% of the people that I would train would not be able to do this up to my standards. And yes, the standards that I was asking of them. Okay, let's flip the machine on here, let's get set up and get her done. Okay, so now we've got this hole here. Obviously we have to weld it and fill it up. So let's start from scratch here. Here's how I would do it to take care of this problem. What we would do is pick a good spot for them to start welding. If you're positioned at your workbench like this, I would always teach to start welding at the top of the hole. And the amount of heat that we're using is always gonna be different in relation to the material thickness that you are using. But essentially when you start, you just wanna start and keep your arc focused on the edge here. What we wanna do now as we start to get some filler material on the edge is we wanna start welding towards ourselves. And at this point, we're only gonna try and get filler material to try and butter up the edge here. Do not try and fill up the whole gap all at once. This is important. If you try and bridge the gap in between the two edges of the hole, in some circumstances, the arc can start to flicker from side to side. This is gonna create something called arc deflection, essentially where your arc is losing its focus. Sometimes with a bigger gap, it can almost sound like your arc is farting. <laughs> what we're gonna to wanna to do is stick to the edge like this and focus your filler material here as well. As you weld around towards yourself at the halfway point, I would want to see somebody extinguish just as they're starting to get uncomfortable. And then what you're gonna do is you're now gonna flip the piece around or you can stand on the other side of the project. And then all we're gonna do at this point is just repeat on the other side. At this point, we do not want to overfill this with filler material and we especially do not want to overheat it. We're gonna focus on getting proper heat input into the workpiece on the other side after we flip it. When you're done these two halves and you're finished going around the edge, it's gonna look something like this here. You can see we have welded around the edge all the way. And at this point, we are now going to get set up and fill the center. Again, we're gonna add a reasonable amount of heat input and use enough filler material that you need. And after you're done, it's gonna look something like this we can see that it is all proud to the surface level of the base material, meaning there's no little spots that are hollow or below surface level of the material. This is very important. Okay, now at this point, we're gonna flip it over and weld the other side. Now, this is the side where we can start to goose it with a little more heat input. The reason why it's okay, in my opinion, to do it on this side is because now as we add more heat input, we're gonna be adding heat input into filler material instead of base material. On the other side, when we were just starting out with our welding, if we were to use a high amount of heat input, essentially what we'd be doing is affecting the structural integrity of the base material, but instead we focused on using a moderate amount of heat so that we made sure we did not overheat the base material. Now that it's flipped over and we are now working on the second side, if we use a little more heat input, we're gonna be affecting the filler material that we added on the other side instead of the base material as severely. As we get welding, of course, just like we did on the other side, we are going to focus on keeping the arc on the edge, but now we can also focus a little bit more heat heading down into the hole that we are trying to fill. And you're basically gonna connect and really dig into the filler material that we added on the other side. Now, after we finish up filling the entirety of this side, again, we want to make sure that the filler material is proud to the surface of the base material. We don't want any hollow areas or sunken material. And you're gonna see why in a second here. Now, to be honest, for the most part, most people that I was training would be able to get to this part pretty confidently, but it was always this next step where the wheels fell off for pretty much everybody. 
We are now going to start working with our grinders. And this is where we are going to bring everything back so that the base material looks completely untouched. Remember what we said at the beginning? The challenge was to make this hole completely disappear. Like for example, if this was to get painted after the fact, there would be no way for anybody to tell that this little fix had been done. Now, when I'm grinding, I'm gonna start out with something with a little bit more of an abrasive grind. However, here's the most important thing, and this is where most people went wrong. You can see here I'm starting out with a flapper wheel on my grinder. This is a pretty coarse finish, and we want to take down the reinforcement of the welding job that we did. We do not want to mess with the surface of the base material at all. When I'm grinding, I'm gonna aim to make sure that I take all the high spots down, and I'm going to do it with this area of the grinder here. When I'm grinding with this area of the pad here, it's gonna keep things a little easier for me to see as I'm working. And I personally find that I get a better feel working with this area of the disc here. Another thing that I'm gonna do at this point here is determine the grain direction of the aluminum base material. Working with aluminum is just like working with wood in a sense. There is a grain direction that you can see to it. Did you know that? Next time you look at a brand new piece of aluminum, take a look at this. You can see it for yourself. This is gonna come in really handy when you're trying to match grain direction for a finishing job like we're doing here. This is also something to consider when you are doing bend tests with your welding. A welding specimen that you are testing should always be done with the grain going in a certain direction if you are gonna bend it after. When I am using the top of my grinding disc, like I talked about, I always try and point the grinding direction in the same direction of the grain that we are trying to follow. It doesn't matter super importantly at this stage, but I'll show you more about this in a sec here and it will come in handy. Like I talked about here, all we're doing is we're just removing the high spot as far as the reinforcement goes. Make sure that when you are grinding, you are not holding your grinder on an angle like this. This is gonna cause the edge of the pad to dig in a little more aggressively. This is gonna leave behind dish marks or heavy swirl lines. They're gonna be really hard to get rid of in the base material. You can see here that there is a little bit left to go and you can see that the grinding disc is starting to hit the surface a little bit more of the base material. So this is where I'm gonna switch to my Scotch-Brite grinding wheel. I'm gonna start by using the exact same area of my grinding disc like I talked about. However, at this point, I'm gonna be making sure that the grinding pad stays very flat. Again, I'm gonna point my grinding direction so that it roughly follows the grain direction of the base material. And because now we are using a grinding pad that is a little less aggressive, as well as holding it pretty much completely flat, this is gonna allow me to be a little bit braver with my grinding. We can now take the rest of this reinforcement down all the way, and I'm basically gonna do this until I've completely blended the welded area into the base material. We can see that things look pretty good here. I haven't dug into the base material too much, and I've kind of spread my grinding around a little bit. I haven't focused in one area too much. We don't see any reinforcement left behind. We don't see any sunken areas or hollow spots. This means that taking a look at the amount of reinforcement that we used earlier was perfect. However, you may notice at this point that we can't see our grain direction at all anymore. So here's what we're gonna do to start making it look like all of this work has not been done at all. I'm going to switch to an orbital sanding disc. Typically, I start out with an 80 grit, and again, I'm going to hold this thing absolutely flat. I'm going to hit the surface of the welded area and the surrounding area, and I'm really gonna make sure that the sanding is spread out uniformly instead of staying in one concentrated area. Again, don't use the edge of the pad, keep it flat. Once I've kind of hit everything so it's a uniform, nice finish, I'm gonna to switch to something like a 200 grit, and then if I want to, I can even go finer than that. Taking a look here after it's finished, you might be able to see a little bit of evidence of the alloy difference between the filler material and the base material. But for the most part, we have completely taken care of the problem that we filled up. We don't see any crazy mistakes that we've made with the grinding that we did. And now we have a perfect blank canvas that we can start working with again. Check this out. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna try and get our grain direction back. But before we get into that, check this out here. There's actually a couple other ways that you can weld this to give yourself some good practice. Remember how we welded half of this, essentially welding towards ourselves, then we flipped it around and did the other half like that? There's a way that we can do this and get much better practice out of it. Now that we know that we're basically grinding all this stuff off after the fact, if you wanna be a little bit braver and get some better practice with welding and torch techniques, try this instead. Do the first half just like we talked about. However, this time when you finish, we're gonna switch our approach of how we are welding the second half with our torch technique. Welding around the first half of the hole, we are essentially holding our torch with a normal standard grip. 
or something that I call an underhand grip. Let's switch this up for the second half. So we're essentially doing something that I call an overhand grip. And if you can get good at this, you are a badass, my friend. We're essentially still gonna hold the torch the exact same way, but the big difference is now we are directing the weld under our hand instead of in front of it. This is something that I practice with something like a lap joint. You can use this when you're working around cool shapes or if you're doing like round fillet welding or something like that. If you can get good with working with an overhand grip as well as an underhand grip, you're gonna open some big doors for yourself later down the line with having some cool, unique style to your welding, as well as doing stuff that's a little bit more consistent across more challenging joints or projects. I demonstrate this with something that I call the split direction weld. Essentially with any joint that you're practicing, you're gonna do half of it with your standard position or grip, and we're gonna stop halfway through the joint. I love practicing this technique with something like a lap joint or going around a piece of pipe with a fillet weld. For the second half of each of these, you're gonna switch to an overhand grip. And this is gonna change the game completely. You will have to adapt to looking at things completely different than you're used to. And then the goal is to do each of these welds right next to each other and compare the differences to see how good you can get at keeping them consistent to one another. Having these results side by side to one another on the same practice piece is a great way that you can start to compare differences and you can really break down the differences between these two techniques and nitpick the details to improve over time. If you want to supercharge how you learn this type of consistency across more challenging stuff, this is absolutely the way to do it. And again, going back to the exercise of what we're doing here where we are filling up a hole, this is a great way that you can introduce this practice technique and you can try it out for yourself and later on in this episode, I'll show you a better way that you can do it with actual joints. Hold up. Okay, so now that we have completely ground and flattened the surface of where we were, and we are confident that our welding has filled up the hole completely, now it's time to check our work and see how we did. Here's a couple things that I do to check my own work. The first is to grab a Scotch-Brite hand pad. Basically, we're just gonna use this with our hand, nothing crazy. The stuff I'm using here is pretty fine, and what I'm gonna do is finish this keeping the grain direction in mind. This is why it was important to take note of this earlier. If you have other welding that you wanna keep safe, you can mask off areas if you wanna protect that. And this is a way as you start to do this finer and finer, you're gonna be able to get that grain direction back and make things look super uniform again. Again, as we take a look at it after you're done, you might be able to see a little bit of mismatch as far as the alloy between the aluminum filler material and base material. But for the most part, you can't even tell that all of this work was done here. Now, if you wanna check out your work at a crazy level, check this out. Let's say looking at this, this part is gonna go for paint after. And we wanna make sure, like we talked about, there is no evidence that this ever even happened. And by the way, this type of thing happens all the time. When you're doing bigger projects and stuff like that, where you have a bunch of holes that have to line up, maybe for like screws, fasteners, bolts, and stuff like that. Sometimes after fabrication and a bunch of welding, these things don't line up anymore. You need to move them for some reason. There's a lot of times when this will be a job that you are required to do, and we just wanna make sure that you can do it properly. So let's check our work at an even crazier level. In my toolbox, I always kept a can of black spray paint. After everything was nice and cool, I would literally spray paint the surface after I was happy with my finishing job. After it dries, you can then take a look at it under the light from different angles. I know that this seems a little bit obsessive, but with really nice projects that you wanna make sure they are absolutely perfect, trust me, nothing sucks more than getting a fresh part back from paint and you can see grinding marks trying to hide the mistake that you were trying to get rid of. After you are done, just grab a paper towel with acetone or lacquer thinner or something like that. You wipe it all off, it is good to go. Come on now, you've just taken the most simple little exercise and learned a ton from it. Like I said, I would take people who were actually pretty good at welding and challenge them to do this. And literally only a tiny amount of these people would be able to do it up to the standards like I am looking at here. It's all good if people who are just coming into a shop don't know how to do this stuff. I was always more than happy to train people and show them all these techniques and teach them this stuff. But if you wanna show up at a new job or something like that with a few extra tricks up your sleeve, this would absolutely be something that I spend time practicing, especially the grinding part. Now for the split direction welding exercises like I was talking about, this is going to be the episode that gets you going on that. It's got some crazy tips about practicing this. Go watch that episode right now. And do a random act of kindness for a stranger today. I am Dusty James, Phil and Chill. We will talk soon, peace. Mm -hmm.